Hemorrhoids are common, and most of the time, thankfully, surgery is not needed to deal with them. And joining me today to tell us more about the signs, symptoms, and treatment options is Dr. Paul Broderick. He's a board-certified proctologist with the Franciscan Physician Network. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. So, Doctor, thanks so much for your time today. I was just mentioning to you that I know what hemorrhoids are and what folks do to deal with them, but it's great to have your expertise today. So maybe the most basic question here, what are hemorrhoids? Yeah, it's a topic of uh, some taboo things on TV, and sometimes it's a, some jokes and what have you, but I like to say that it's like getting a pit in the face with a pie. It's funny till it happens to you. Right. And, yeah, it's embarrassing, but for other comments, so what are hemorrhoids? Hemorrhoids are groups of vessels, some call it columns of vessels, that are anatomically supposed to be there. So somebody says, oh, I don't have any. Congratulations, you don't have any problems with them. But anatomically, yes, those vessels are there. But if there becomes some dilation, inflammation, irritation of such, then it can bring a variety of unpleasantries associated with it. Yeah, and so everybody has them. It's a matter of whether we have a problem with them. So how do we know we have a problem? What are the unpleasantries, as you say? Yeah, so it can be a whole range of symptoms. And I'll put a bit of a, uh, I'll say a disclaimer, but everything that's sore and irritated gets called, quote, hemorrhoids, okay? Mm. Well, there's other pathology that can occur there. Yes, hemorrhoids are very common. It's an anatomical norm, but... If somebody should have a variety of symptoms, such as anything from maybe hygiene challenges, discomfort with bowel movements, some itching, yes, to bleeding of varying amounts, those are common symptoms, but those all deserve to be have an appropriate evaluation. I recommend people start with their primary care physician because other things can do that that may be much more of a health concern than what hemorrhoids are. Hemorrhoids are benign veins. They don't get to where they transform into something bad or, or let's say harmful, but there are such things that can occur there that including types of cancer. So everything gets called hemorrhoids. Let's make sure they are. Right. So yeah, that's very important. Yeah. So let's talk about that, the diagnosis, I'm assuming, patient history, that kind of thing. And you, as you say, maybe start with your primary, be referred to a specialist. But in general, then, after a patient history, is it really more of a visual test? How do you diagnose? So, yeah, you hit on some good topics there. It's quite a bit of some good medicine that is getting a good history. What are some of the challenges? What might have brought this on? How long has this been going on? All those things figure into hmm. perhaps the degree of evaluation, exam, or the treatments that may come. And yeah, so somebody's got some issues, they've had these problems, they've maybe tried something over the counter, and they're embarrassed, and so finally they go to the to their family doctor and or specialist. But yes, it's a visual, meaning, yeah, you, first the doctor's going to feel around, is there lumps, bumps, something that's not supposed to be there. Number two, yeah, there's a little plastic tube that you look at the area and so are these inflamed, is there bleeding, is there some other pathology of concern? And so there are external hemorrhoids which are covered with skin, there are internal hemorrhoids that are covered with the lining of the GI tract and those deserve different approaches, therapies, and depending on the doc's comfort with these things, some family doctors are comfortable with how we do this, others either hadn't had much exposure to it or they've got a specialist nearby that they have a good relationship with and boom, just get them right to them. That works out well for both. Yeah. Is there an age range when we think about who's at the greatest risk per se? Is this likely to happen to older folks after the age of 40, something like that? Yeah, that is certainly the case. So aging doesn't help a lot of things. So tissues (laughs) change, et cetera. One of the more common issues or if it first shows up for people is for women in childbearing years. So the pregnancy itself, the delivery itself, um, maybe multiple pregnancies, the additive effects of things, that can certainly affect women's odds with those. So yeah, a number of women may have initially some in their 20s. For men, sometimes a very physical work. I'm young, I'm strong, I can lift that. Sure. And then uh, over some years, it maybe accumulate so that 
all that straining. So, yeah, I see a number of people in their 20s. But as purely an age factor, yes, it is. It tend to be more common uh, over 40 and to 50. And some of that, too, is maybe when the women are completely confident they're not going to be having any more babies and it hasn't gotten any better. And, yes, it has gotten to be more of a problem. So now they're ready to address something where yeah, maybe they mean, yeah. at a different point in their life. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, at that point, time to see Dr. Broderick and yeah, no more kids coming. <laughs> so let's talk then about treatment options. First of all, will they go away on their own? Are there home remedies? Do you recommend over the counter medications? What's the progression here in terms of like sort of the path of least resistance, working our way up to the more right. uh, severe Basically. treatment options, if you will? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's let's say the hemorrhoids themselves may not go away. However, the swelling or inflammation or the symptoms with them may sure. fade. And foundationally, hydration, lean diet with fiber. So we can be as regular as we may be able to be as far as having bowel movements, but a good fiber diet, perhaps stool softeners to get through a phase is foundational regardless. So throughout the treatment spectrum, that's very important. The roles of, say, topical medications, including over-the-counter, et cetera, yes, there's definitely a role there. Again, we often combine that with the other modalities because it's somewhat foundational. So they can certainly have some anti-inflammatory effects, some soothing effects. We do a little bit of some coaching on things about, you know, let's try to avoid some straining, some things that physically could aggravate some things. Yeah, number one, that level. People do that. Things get better guess what? I don't see them. Or they don't see their family doc. They've calmed down. Okay, great. And so let's say that that approach has not been enough. And so there are prescription medications. Again, they're more potent anti-inflammatories and often the primary care physicians are comfortable at that level. And most of them aren't set up for handling things beyond that. So yeah, there's certainly a role for that. And so often a family doc will say, well, try these in the meantime, I'll get you an appointment with, with Dr. You know, so-and-so. And so what's the next level? There's a pretty broad spectrum of people that fit into a non-surgical procedural spectrum. And so there's a few out there. The two most common, by far, non-surgical treatments, the one that's been around the longest is called hemorrhoid banding or hemorrhoid ligation. So if things are wanting to turn out, and bleeding and swelling, it's literally a little band is used to strangle that redundant tissue. Sounds kind of scary, but people do it real well. Well, They drive back to, well, I see people from a couple hours away and they they drive back, they're fine. It's very powerful. That's been around for many decades. The reason it's around is because it works. There's another common technique where some light energy is delivered to the base of the hemorrhoids to cause some things to shrivel and essentially set the clock back, but it's not an excision. Again, few seconds, very uh, tolerated. People drive themselves home, go back to work, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Like any tool, it has its strengths, it has its limits. And so there are times where either a situation or someone's been so afraid of the situation and they may show up and the non-surgical things are no longer applicable, yeah. unfortunately. And yes, there is a role for surgery. Let's say, oh, well, that's the last thing I want. True. But you could say that about most any surgery. But yes, there is still a role for traditional hemorrhoidectomy. And say that's scary. Yeah, the first week or two, like any surgery, isn't much fun. If there's an upside to that, people that have put up with this so long are just really such a point of misery yeah. that the reward, the return, is so immense that they're grateful, but it's natural to to be reluctant and it's embarrassing. It's all these things that people are commonly wish to avoid, yeah. understandably. But yeah, surgery does have a role. It's outpatient. People are asleep for it, but that's when things are really separated out. We've yeah. done the foundational stuff. Yeah, tried, you know, perhaps non-surgical if it's applicable. Yeah. But again, if people are there, the, the relief is welcomed and, yeah, and they're I'm sure. uh, they're glad. But it's like any surgery, it's no fun the first week or two, especially. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure. 
I guess the million dollar question, Doc, is do you ever really get rid of them? I know you said we always have them, but the problems that folks have with hemorrhoids, do you ever really get rid of them? Or once you've had them, are they more likely to come back? Is it just more about managing hemorrhoids? How's that work? Yeah, all of that to some degree. And what I mean by that is um, some people are more prone to them. Like some people are maybe more prone to kidney stones yeah. or maybe someone's more prone to varicose veins in their lower legs. So some people are a bit more prone to them. And so there is a role for what would be managing the symptoms generally in that non-surgical realm yeah. on top of the conservative diet, et cetera, to have that person not necessarily progress to a natural stage to where, you know, they have surgery like dad did or something of that nature. And so (laughs) dad and his hemorrhoids, you know? (laughs) Yeah. So there's a group of people that, yeah, it is a bit of a management approach. So I'll tell people, even in the non-surgical treatment realm, I said, your your trigger is going to be lighter. And one, you're not going to want to put up with the symptoms. Two, it's not as scary as you thought and made up. And, Three, you understand, you know, now what, if we don't, where it may be headed. Right. And so people are like, yeah, I'm not putting up with something <laughs> two years again when I can go and a visit and a trip and a few second treatment and I'm back on my, right. back on my way. Yeah. Suffering with something kind of day in, day out doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. And I told you before we got started today, and I don't know what it says about me, but I was really eager to learn more about hemorrhoids today. I don't know why, but I was, and I have, and I really appreciate your time. So thanks so much. You stay well. Uh, Thank you. Nice talking to you, Scott. And for more information, visit franciscanhealth.org and search hemorrhoids. And if you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social channels. And be sure to check out the full podcast library for additional topics of interest. This is the Franciscan Health Doc Pod. I'm Scott Webb. Stay well, and we'll talk again next time.